The Coalition. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, we are delighted to be speaking to the brilliant cast and creatives responsible for the Searchlight film, Empire of Light. We're gonna kick things off by introducing you to the African members on the call today, starting with our facilitator, Katia Woods in Philadelphia, Dana Abercrombie in New York, Samuel Legat in Washington, DC, Rhonda Rasha Penrice in Atlanta, Ruben Regald in Miami, Florida, and Nancy Green in Baltimore, Maryland. I am gonna let you guys do what you do so well, and I'll see you on the other side. Hi. Hey, I'm Samuel Leggett from JVS Media and Productions. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, as a lover of cinema, um, like I just appreciated what you did with this. Like you, Sam, the way you directed it, but as a whole, you guys brought something of essence very important here. But Sam, the way that you wrote this, you tackled two distinct things that are still apparent right now today's time, which is mental awareness and health and racial discrimination. And so the questions go to actually Olivia um, and Michael. I, I wanted to check with you guys, how did you guys deal with handling your characters individually, just from the racial discrimination side <clears throat> and then from the mental awareness of what she's dealing with? Um, and then together, they're having to also deal with it you know, as as a whole, like they're having to complement each other, but also get outside their comfort zone while dealing with their same. So I was curious y'all's approach with both your characters for Steven and for um, Olivia, your character. Um, I feel like that was the question was, I've, I've been thrown. Um, was, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my bit. Yeah, and then please, please. Um, but, um, for, for me, I think I had an easier time of it because I had I had Sam who had, um, forgive me, talking about you like you're not here, but Sam who'd spent his childhood watching Like a Hawk, every change in eye makeup, every change in uh, behavior. So I had the, the perfect person to, and when I could say, coming off lithium, what's that like? When did this happen? How, how did you know that something was coming or what was, I had, I had the best helper in that to explain to me because he'd seen it all through his life. Um, so for me, I had him holding my hands through it. And because I, you know, thankfully I haven't had to deal with any mental health issues myself. So uh, it was easier for me and I can see how what you had to go through obviously was a different <laughs> experience. Yeah. Um, for me, like, you know, reacting to the mental health stuff was um, really interesting because I haven't really been around um, someone like that before. Um, so I learned a lot within that um, process about that topic. And also as well, Sam had like a, this research script <clears throat> where if you was reading something, you know, you could click on it and it would like, take you to a lot of the research that he'd done um, and stuff that we could help us know more. Um, and that's where I got um, a lot of like, the, you know, the physical kind of research stuff from. But um, in terms of like, the, the racial aspect of it, you know, it, I feel like, you know, I haven't really experienced it like that, but um, my my acting coach, Gary Nurse, who I've done a lot of work with um, for this character, he was, you know, around the same age as Stephen within um, this time frame, like in the 80s. So he was kind of like someone that would have experienced a lot of this. So for authenticity and stuff like that, I'd ask him a lot of questions and, you know, how he would react to um, a situation like this and understanding how I would react to it in this time and kind of merging those um ideas and feelings together, um, which was really important for me. You guys did phenomenal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Green with Film Critique. And um, I just wanted to say, yes, I, I absolutely really enjoyed this movie. Um, I love the dynamics between everyone. And uh, my question is for Sam. I wanted to know, um, sort of blending the two different issues that they're dealing with. On one side, um, she's dealing with the oppression of everyone thinking that she's crazy because of men and the things that they were doing to her and he's having to deal with racism. Uh, what was your intent behind that to say in terms of how those two fields sort of um, 
can merge and the experiences of people can bring them together. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think I was trying to, I just said actually this a minute ago, but there's an inner crisis and an outer crisis. There's She's going through something, an inner turmoil, and that inner turmoil is reflected, um, which is obviously bipolar, schizophrenia, whatever you want to call it, and 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 that's mirrored by an outer crisis. And the outer crisis is the Thatcher years, you know, huge unemployment, terrible racial policies. <clears throat> and those two things run concurrently, and they kind of break in on each other in the riot. The outer world literally smashes the glass and comes in you, in a way that is saying you can't keep it at bay. You can't pretend it's not there. It's gonna, it's gonna come and get you. But the irony about those years, those those years in the early eighties, that when I was a teenager, which when I was the same age as Stephen, really, was that even though it was a time of great political upheaval and racial upheaval, it was also a time when we had these role models, these bands that were genuinely diverse and that were that were making music about social issues that went straight to number one in the charts. I mean, it was an incredible time of creativity. So you had the specials, the selector, the beat, truly multiracial bands, working class, making amazing music. And then at the same time, you had in the movies, which again, you see reflected in, the, in, in our movie, a time when for the first time, there were commercial movie stars, Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, you know, who were breaking through. So there were these role models for young uh, black men like Stephen. So for me, it, it has it had a bit of both, really. Um, but I, I wanted to try and tell both those stories at the same time. It's not to say that there isn't more than enough to make a movie about just mental illness, and there's more than enough to make a movie just you know being a young black man in the early '80s. But I felt the two things somehow fitted together and and um, and spoke to me, and 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 I uh, and, and I tried to tell both stories. Nice, nice, and it was it was done very well beautifully done thank you thank you very much thank you hi my name is Ruben Peralta from cocalecas.net uh, this movie really touched me in a, in a really uh, you know deep sense because when I was a kid in the Dominican Republic my best friend was going to to the movies he was going to the movies I have this experience of going to the movies getting dressed sitting in a in a in a, in a dark room and watching a movie how do you guys feel now that we have streaming and, and this movie was made to watch in a theater? And, and, I, and I feel that this love letter to the movie is, is to, to, to take people to the movies, to, to have this action of going to the films instead of staying home and, and, and watch a movie and, and like, you know, like we're doing now. How do you guys feel? My question for Sam and Olivia. Mm -hmm. Go on, Sam. Um, well, I, I know that we probably f feel the same. Sam will put it more eloquently than me, no doubt. But um, <laughs> I, I love going to the cinema. I love sitting in a room that is nothing like my home, that is 10 times the size of, of any room we could ever have with people I don't know and having a shared experience. I feel that about the theatre too. But cinema can go to places the theatre can't. You know, you can't have an explosion on stage. Well, we can, but it's never as good. And <laughs> um, just that shared, you know, if it's emotional, you know that all these human beings, wherever they're from, are feeling the same stuff. It's, it, it is an extraordinary experience. Mm. And it's something uh, I, I don't go as often as I, I used to go because we do have the opportunity to watch films at home and mm. but when I go I'm really pleased I've been and it's something that can't be touched it can't be recreated in your sitting room it's just not big enough and or loud enough and you know to feel that bass in your stomach when the music's playing it's it it's a breathtaking and beautiful experience that I really I feel sad that maybe my kids won't experience as much as I did but I, I, want, I want to force them to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, could, I can't put it much better than that. I mean, I do think that we we create it. I mean, it's a, it's in a miracle in a way that you know, when I was researching this this movie and I was originally going to set it in a slightly larger South Coast English town called Brighton, um, and I researched how many cinemas there were in Brighton after the war, and it's a small town, and there were 46 cinemas in Brighton. Wow, and then even in 1980, there were 14 
right? I mean, it had gone down, but there were still 14 cinemas in a, quite a small town. Wow. And now there are four, right? Mm. Um, and so obviously you, you just think it's been on the wane since the advent of television. Mm. So it, this is no different. But I do think that what we have now, we are preserving that experience. And I think that what's happened to cinemas, which is that the advent of things like Dolby Sound and Dolby Atmos, I mean, and, and, and surround sound and comfort and food and ease and community, those things we were deprived of during the pandemic. I think we, we're going to want even more. So I am an optimist about it. I feel like that experience is going to be preserved. And it's really just about getting out there and, and sending the message. The issue is about keeping the variety of movies available to you in the cinema. So it's not entirely dominated by giant franchises. And that, that is the thing that I think we, we're all fighting for, that we can make a non-franchise event movie like 1917. We can make a movie like this and they're seen in the cinema. So it's up to the filmmakers to just be up for the challenge of making movies that use all the tools of of the cinema to make it exciting to get you in you know and that's why let's face it that's why we're here that's why i'm talking to you is why we're all talking to each other we want people to go to the fucking cinema <laughs> that's just like you know uh, and and it, whether it's to see this or something else i don't i honestly don't care you know i obviously want people to see this movie but you know the experience of it is something i really believe in and it's in the movie steven says you know Go and sit in the dark where they don't, they can't see your face. They don't even know you're there, right? That little beam of light is escape. And I think it is for a lot of people. And I think we have to try and remember that we can escape in a different way when we're not in our front rooms. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, a, you know, it's exciting. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katia Woods for Cup of Soul Show in the Philadelphia Tribune. Uh, one of the themes about this, I feel like everybody that works in this movie house is some type of misfit, misfit and they have found community amongst each other, you know, no matter, it's kind of like no matter what's going on in their lives, this theater, everything that represents each other is like um, a bonus family to help cope with those things. Toby, can you talk a little bit about that? Because your character reveals something, I don't want to spoil it, intimate about himself. And 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 Olivia's character is like, what? Like, how have we been working <laughs> together for so long? And I don't, it's like, because I think I felt like he felt that we know so much about what Olivia is going through that he's like, I wanted her to know that she's not the only one. My burden is not mental, but I do have one too. So can you speak on that a little bit, Toby? Yeah, I think it is mental uh, on one level. I think that he has self, he's done, he's sort of, his strategy to, he's had a trauma in his life and the way he's dealt with the trauma is to bury himself in a dark box uh, <laughs> in a cinema and to see life through a tiny uh, window and to look at the world through a tiny window and to basically take all color out of himself, you know, his clothes, his face, he lives in the dark. And I think that that's not terribly successful as a strategy. I think that, you know, it's a kind of ticking bomb. And, and oddly, when Stephen comes, he's a bit, un, he's unlocked by that because the, the sun that we discover and we realize we've seen a picture of that sun in amongst the movie stars, we've seen there's this one image selected. I think he he realizes oh, my son's oh, yeah, to a certain extent my son has found me. Uh, another son has found me, and he has projected that relationship unwittingly onto this newcomer. And it's a beautiful thing in the script that there is a kind of ghost story going on in the cinema mm -hmm. with this character you know because those guys were like ghosts the projectionists they were they tended to be guys and they were like ghosts in the machine of the cinema and uh i think that 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 yeah I, that's sort of something of what i feel about it and, and i think it's a sort of shadow story to the main story in a way
I answer. Hello. Dana Abercrombie, The Coalition. My question is for Sam Mendes and Olivia Coleman. What I love about Hillary is there's different emotional beats to her character and especially how she interacts with others. Can you talk about from an actress standpoint and also from the writer standpoint with Sam of finding those beats and how she will react in those different states that she is in? But for me, I grew up watching the cycle of mental illness. You know, the cycle for me, for me watching my mother was that she would be medicated and feel numb. This is certainly what Hillary's journey is. Uh, feel like she she somehow um, wasn't fully in the world. Um, during that time, she would she would often be taken advantage of by men, um, or she would form a, a bit of a crush, um, and and uh, it would bottle up. Um, then perhaps something would trigger coming off the lithium, coming off the drugs. And she would go through a period of great freedom and joy and, and exhilaration, like she was high, just really high. And then it would, something would go wrong in that period. It would lead to loss of sleep. And, uh, a, a, and gradually she would start to lose control and descend into the darkness. Um, and that was when it got really serious. And, and, then, you know, the, the, one of the things I really wanted to do in, in the movie was to dramatize the denial you go through when you suffer from mental illness, rather than explain it. You know, I, I think um, mental illness remains stigmatized, not talked about properly. It's very difficult to talk about. You know, if you went into hospital uh, with a, a tumor and came out, uh, I would say, how are you, right? If you go into a mental hospital and you come out having been medicated, I, I wouldn't say anything probably. That, that is, the, it, it, it's, it's still a cloak of awkwardness and not knowing how to talk about it. It's partly because it's a behavioral issue. And for me, the, the, the thing I wanted most to dramatize was the fact that you can know you need help and yet fight with every fiber of your being to not be taken into a mental hospital. So the scene I'm talking about is that she is fighting. She will not let them in. And yet she has packed her bag. And to me, that's what the show don't tell theory of, you know, that's what I wanted to dramatize. I, I didn't want to, I wanted you to be able to understand that both of those things can be believed absolutely and, and, and not contradict each other. Right. So that's that for me was the, the the hub of the whole Hillary journey. And then after that, coming out, having been medicated again, feeling humiliated, remembering everything you went through, feeling shame, um, and trying to put your life back together again. That was the cycle. And, and my job with, with Olivia was to make sure that every notch in that journey was hit. And that the and that we knew exactly where we were in that cycle mm -hmm. and how those little moments manifested themselves, whether it was more eye, eye makeup, no washing of the hair, different clothes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but you know, or absolute certain. I mean, one of my favorite moments is is the moment that Stephen tries to help her and says, you know, he tries to say, I I I it's an illness, it's not your fault. And she just laughs in his face. But she's gone past that point where she can have a a, a coherent conversation with with anyone about it it's, it's it's too far gone so those things were all from my own memory and i tried to communicate them to olivia as best i could so she could she could uh give that journey life what i felt was she did it so well and at times i found it almost impossible to watch you know because i it actually triggered thing, memories in me of that experience when i was little of watching someone fall apart um and, and i think particularly in that in that apartment scene when she gets taken away i found that really uh kind of uh it was cathartic on one level another level i i i wanted to run away <laughs> anyway that was a very long answer but you know i mean from my point of view uh sam made my job so easy that you know as i i think i said earlier but every every moment i could ask him um, and he was so clear and made himself so vulnerable, was very honest about everything he'd seen. And um, and he, he makes a very safe environment. So you feel trusted and looked after and you can absolutely let rip. And he will 
help you every step of the way. So it, re it really did make my, and I think for all of us, he, he made us, he, he made the right environment for us all to do what we needed to do. Thank you. Hi, Rhonda here. Hi. I have a question for Michael because I watch um, Top Boy and Blue Story. Yeah. So I want to know what went into your decision to do this film and what did you hope to achieve in Steven that could distinguish you from those particular portrayals that a lot of people know you for? Um. What went into the decision of doing this film was the fact that um, Sam was obviously doing it. And um, I, I really loved um, the way 1917 was done. So I knew Roger Deakins was doing it as well. That was exciting. Um, and I also knew that Olivia Coleman was going to be doing it. So those um, aspects for me <laughs> was a perfect package. And then, um, you know, on top of that, the script for me, when I was reading it, I really connected with it. And I wasn't actually sure why. Um, and I've never really admitted that before, but I could do it now because hearing Toby speak, it is you do have those things, feeling or something where you don't actually know what it is that you connect with, but I just did, you know? Um, and then throughout the process, I really just started to understand more the importance of portraying um, a character like this within a story like this, you know? It's, it's really important um, for, for those people that I've portrayed in the in the stuff that you you've seen you get what i'm trying to say because people like steven they give and seeing people like steven on screen it gives people like the youth starting to believe in that's um positive you know steven doesn't do anything negative or has it he hasn't got any like you know malice towards anyone or trying to do something to you know he just wants to love and you know you see that in the moments where a lot of people run away and did run away from the situation he lent in um, more you know to um, find out more about um, Hillary's situation and stuff like that and actually wanting to be there for her which we don't really get to see a lot you know so for me that was really important and um, I think for, like, in terms of finding something in Stephen that was different it was just just I already know like how it was going to look aesthetic um, aesthetically you know what I'm trying to say being in the 80s and you know um, kind of having a character that speaks a bit different to how we talk, you know what I'm saying? Obviously I've done Lovers Rock already, um, which was also set in the 80s, but this was just more of a, you know, following a character and actually having a lot more to, you know, sink your teeth into sort of thing. Um, so yeah, man, I feel like it was just gonna always be different just by the way it looked and the way I spoke and by the stuff that he was interested in, you know, him doing architecture and stuff like that. like. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know any um, young black youth that's um, done architecture. To be honest with you, so to represent someone like that was really important for me. But yeah, it was just good to um, establish someone that was just different to me um, in general, anyway. But also different to someone like Jamie and someone like Marco and the stuff that I've done before, um, which was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, cast and creators, <laughs> for Empire of Light. Uh, again, it's such an amazing movie. And uh, a special shout out uh, to Tanya. You definitely, the way you crafted and the subtleties that you brought into your, your performance as his mother uh, was, uh, was, was memorable. <laughs> Very kind of you to say. Thank you. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film and TV critics, Thank you for watching this edition of After Roundtables. Have a great day and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye.